Thank you. Good evening. So, first of all, Happy New Year. And um, I just wanted to do a little bit of a check-in. Who has got no idea who I am whatsoever? You're thinking, who's that guy at the front? Okay, one at the back. Oh, she's an employee, so she doesn't count. A few of you. Okay, so and actually you all know me. Don't be naughty. All right, guys, well, in that case, I don't need to introduce myself because literally everybody who just put their hand up was just being naughty. So, <laughs> so, so thank you very much. I'm glad you're here. And this, if you know me, you'll know this is a theme I've been speaking about for some time, which is, in a, in a sense, the transition of our profession to one of coaching, stroke, task, orientation, stroke, progress, stroke, success, stroke, call it whatever you will, to a much more transformational space for dialogue and for self-understanding and self-actualization. And so through the course of this evening, I would like to introduce you to some ideas that I've been having for the last, I don't know, five years or so, um, which have begun to really percolate through the Anima system. Now, as a result of them percolating through the Anima system, many will be familiar with the two. You, you will pretty much have gone like, yeah, yeah, what's, what's so new about this? Believe me, it's relatively new in the coaching world, even if for you it might feel somewhat familiar. What I would like to do, though, is deepen our thoughts around it, deepen our understanding around what do we mean by transformational dialogue and why call it dialogue rather than transformational coaching? You know, if you've engaged with us in our school, you'd have done a course called the Diploma in Transformational Coaching. What on earth is Nick doing changing to dialogue? Does this mean my, my certificate no longer counts for anything? Of course it does. You know, coaching is a first step towards, towards gathering a set of skills that enables you to work with a bunch of people in a particular way. Dialogue takes that a little step further. And I think, you know, the journey that I see most coaches going on is they shift from a process-driven approach called coaching to a dialogic process. And over the course of the years of practice, you start to be with your clients in a way that's absolutely unique and authentic to you, rather than based and predicated upon things you learned in our school. That doesn't mean those things don't have an influence. They, don't, they, they become part of your DNA. But you're not practicing what we teach anymore. You're being yourself with a set of new skills, but most of all, with a human being. So I just want to share a little bit of a caveat to start off with if this thing works, which it clearly is not going to. That's interesting. Uh, from my team, don't worry guys, I don't expect you to do one, but from my team, who would like to be a PowerPoint slave tonight? Jay, thank you. give Jay a round of applause. So Jay, I'm just gonna give you, uh, if you can see me, I'm gonna give you a little nod, okay? Can you see me? Yeah. All right, so, actually I'll just put these through like quite speedy, just click them through. Go for it, Jay, in your own time. So basically this presentation is unclear, it's poorly planned. <laughs> It's not relevant at all. It's not original. It's, it's unattractively rational, something that often gets leveled at me, and I totally agree. And finally, it's not even true. So I, I'm gonna turn my back. For, I'm gonna turn my back. In fact, I'm gonna literally stand here on this spot for the rest of the evening. I'm gonna turn my back for two seconds, and if you guys wanna leave the room based on this set of caveats, I wouldn't blame you. However, Jay, just shove on for a second to the next slide. I wanna talk about what's good about this talk. I hope. And just go through that, Jay, and we'll see if we can figure this PowerPoint malarkey out as we go. It's totally clear. It's utterly relevant. It's fresh and it's vibrant. It's rational. Yes, it's rational and it's based on years, 18 years of experience of me being a coach. And finally, it's spot on and accurately describes your experience. How can those two be true? Answer me that, coaches. Paradox. Interesting. Thanks, Libby. Mindset. Mindset. Who said that? Yes, thank you. Great. What else? Perspective. Perspective. Great. And anything else? Perception. Perception. Mm -hmm. Mood. Great. And also, it's relevance to you. There will be some people in this room, I guarantee, who will listen to me talk for the next hour and go like, Phew. well, it was nice to see my mates from Animas, but that was a pretty much a waste of time intellectually. That's okay. That's okay. It might be. And there'll be some of you who say, God, I totally get that. That resonates with my experience. It doesn't feel new to me. He's not taught me anything new, but it totally resonates with my experience of being a coach and being a practitioner of this thing we call coaching. So over the course of this next hour, what I'd love to do is have that conversation with you, and you can decide what it means to you. Like, I'm not here to give you some truth that's fixed in stone that somehow you have to adopt as a, as a predicate for your practice, no. This is a set of ideas that I've sort of grown into over the course of the last 18 years, and specifically over the last five years, I'd say, that I feel like have, have, have feel true to me, but they're not true in and of themselves. 
So I just want to lay that as a, as a bit of a caveat. Now, Jay, my, Mr. Mr. PowerPoint slave, um, just chuck up. That is really annoying, isn't it? I wonder if I just step back a bit, if that helps. But then I block your picture. So, um, Jay, just do the next bit. This is a little bit of an exercise for you guys as we try to sort out some techie issues at the front here. If, and I don't know if you guys can read that, if there was no coaching rule book, and I, I talked about this at the summit as well, didn't I, about how we need to break the rules if we're gonna move our profession on. If there were no coaching rule book, how would you really be with your client? If I wasn't looking, if Animas wasn't looking, if the ICF wasn't looking, if Rob didn't have his BDI on you through your webcam, yes he does, if all those things weren't true, and you were just being the way you wanted to be, how would you really be with your clients? I want to be super duper honest and have a chat with your neighbor just for a couple of minutes, and I want to hear from some of you what your thoughts are. Go for it. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very thank you very much. Thank you very much guys. Thank you. Wonderful. So we've got it fixed. What happened is they've given us exactly the same clicker. So I picked up theirs instead of my own. <laughs> Perspective, you see? So yeah, Jason, your slavery days are over. Go. So let me have a little bit of feedback, and you might need to raise your voice, unlike me, you can so casually just use the microphone at the front here, but you might need to raise your voice like a hero. So who would like to share their thoughts on what you would really be like? And if what you're gonna say is, the way I am, then wonderful. So, who would like to share? Be brave. Yes. Hi, I wouldn't be thinking so much about the boundaries and the rules that I've been trained into, and I'd be yes. free flowing what I was given an example of when I first started training, how I because I didn't really know the rules. I was coaching, doing the swap, and the, and the girl said to me, wow, you're really good, are you following the, the, the questions? I was like, no. Yeah. So I think that was one of my best coaching sessions, nice. was yeah. one of the first ones I ever did. Great, thank you, what's your name? Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. And I think I saw her, hi, Mary. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I think for me, what I miss uh, well, about following the rules yeah. is really sort of celebrating my client's achievement. Oh, okay. um, sometimes I just feel like saying, great, that's excellent, yeah. you're doing the right thing, you know. Yeah. Those are the things, though, I'm not supposed to say. Uh -huh. by, you know, Based on who? Well, that's kind of what we've been taught. Great. Right. Yeah. Poor old animal, say, what do people Thank you, thank you, Mary. Who else left there? Yeah. For me, it's just the experience of people sharing stuff they think is earth shattering and, and just wanting to say, you know, that's really normal. Right. A lot of people feel that way. Okay. You know? And having had someone do that with me and go, yeah, that's normal. Uh -huh. God, it makes you feel better. Yeah. You know, so just And what's your that. fear of actually doing that? Well, to be fair, I have done that with them. <laughs> 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 Such a rule <laughs> breaker. Seriously. But it's right. heartbreaking if they're really struggling. Oh, yeah. Right, thank you. And I saw a couple of other hands. Uh, yes, go for it now. Giving advice. Giving advice. Tell me about giving advice. <laughs> what would you love to give advice on if you could? What do I, everything. Everything, okay. <laughs> I'm okay, they're not okay. Uh, precisely, great, thank, thank you, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Anyone else, can we let me take a couple more? Yes, at the middle there, hi. I do echo what was just said, the stroking element. Um, obviously, um, I completely get what I was told to stroke, but there are times when someone will be sitting there crying in front of me, and I find it really hard not to kind of go, Issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want, to, I want, but then I don't want to get in the ditch with them. So I have to kind of just let that moment happen. So I think the strokes is, I find that. What, what's your name? Taylor. Ta Taylor. Ah, yeah. oh, Taylor. Yes, great. Uh, Taylor, we're always stroking them. <laughs> but we are. Every time we say hello, every time we say goodbye, every time we say anything to them, we're stroking them. Yeah. Stroking is an act of recognition. That's all. Now the question is, what's driving the way you're recognizing them? And that's what we'll explore tonight, is what's going on between you that either makes it useful or not useful. Like what's being satisfied, your own compulsion or their need? The relationship or yourself? And those are the, some of the things we'll explore through this evening. Thank you. And let me take one more, if there is one. Yes, Charlie. Um, I've started doing this recently, but it's addressing 
what I feel is an underlying issue uh -huh. to what they're talking about based on patterns nice. that emerge through application. So I felt more like, are we breaking the rules? But it feels like an elephant in the room. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm just going to say and see where it lands. Okay. That's such a great one for me to end on before I start my presentation, because I think if we, even as a profession, think that's breaking the rules, then we're broken, right? If we think that naming an elephant in the room is breaking the rules, there's something problematic with our profession. Now, whether that's because of animas, or whether that's because of the profession, whether it's because of the ICF, whether it's because of whatever it is, I don't fully know yet, but I would say that's a problem that needs to be addressed. If we as coaches who are seeing a pattern in front, emerging in front of us can't name the pattern for fear that we are guiding or advising or directing or doing whatever you think in your head you're doing, that's problematic. So let's, if it's okay, dive into what I mean by transformational dialogue and, and think about what, what are the problems that we're seeing in the coaching profession that make this shift, I think, imperative, at least within some quarters. So, hey Tracy, I don't know why I just noticed you there. Um, right, so here's, here's what I see too much of. Number one, playing by the rules. You know, I don't know if you were, who was at the summit out of interest? Yeah, so I had a little conversation with somebody there who asked um, some, some question. I said, why are you doing that? And they said, because what I've been taught. And I said, it's the wrong reason to do it. If that's why you're doing it, it's the wrong reason to do it. Like, you need to be behaving the way you're behaving in coaching because it's the most effective way to behave for the client and for the relationship, not because it's what the rules say. So number one is stop playing by the rules. You know, it's funny, we have people who come to us and say, but Nick, I'm a little, or, or Rob, or whoever, I'm, I'm a bit concerned it's an unregulated profession. Let's celebrate that it's an unregulated <laughs> profession. It actually gives you the flexibility to be who you want to be. The minute we start regulating coaching, we're doomed because we can't be genuine with our client when we're playing by the rules of the regulation. So number one is stop playing by the rules. Number two is caution and timidity in your coaching. And by the way, when I say you, I don't mean you. <laughs> Live on, it's your coaching. <laughs> but so, so take your as a, as a philosophical your rather than a specifically you, like who me? Um, like this, this is like what I'm seeing is, is caution and timidity. But if, what if I do that and, and I upset them? Good, let them get upset. If there's something to be upset about, it needs to be explored. If it upsets them, there's a reason it upsets them. And that needs to be explored in coaching. Number three, there's a lack of real honesty that goes on in coaching. We're afraid to say what we really see, what we really think, what we really feel, what's really going on between us or what's going on in the world. We're afraid of being truly honest and naming what we're seeing. Number four, there's a, a sense in which there's a desire for approval and acceptance in the coaching profession. Am I okay, ICF, by your rules? Am I okay, Animas, by your rules? Am I okay, society, by what you think coaching is? And lastly, this is one that I find interesting, is that we often try to manage the client towards our expectations. They arrive flustered, and we think they should get mindful. When did mindfulness become such an important aspect of coaching? Maybe being flustered is how they actually are. And we need to accept that, that flustered has some quality that can add to the coaching, not be got rid of. So when we start to, to actually work with the client as they are, not as we want them to be, then we have the real person and the real relationship in front of us. So that's what I'm saying that's problematic. And let me quickly whiz through our route today. I wanna to take a look at the changing context for coaching, and I'm gonna do this relatively quickly. I want to take a look at how coaching, I think, might be moving into the future and why that makes transformational dialogue all the more important. <laughs> I want to then talk about what it means to be human together and, and why that is relevant. What does it mean to be human together? Because I think, first and foremost, that's what we need to be thinking about is how do we be human together, not how do we coach and client together? I want to take a look at what I mean by transformational dialogue and why do I call it dialogue and why is it transformation and why those two combined? You know, if you, if you know me for any length of time, you know that I don't use words lightly. When I use words, I, I, I think them through. So I don't just go, oh, transformational, that sounds nice. Dialogue, ooh, that's kind of warm. Now, this is specific, so I want to talk to you about why transformational dialogue. Um, by the way, if you're at the back and you're thinking, what's that little tiny writing on the screen? Um, we can make the slides available to you afterwards. I'm not, I'm not uh, precious about slides, so uh, Zoe, wherever you, Zoe, yep. We can figure a way to get the slides to the guys, okay? Um, I want to take a look at some influences and some precursors. The, you know, the great thing about what I'm saying and have been saying for quite some time now is I'm not a lone voice. I'm part of a, of a movement within the coaching field, which is shifting coaching from being what it is to what it might be, but I'm not alone. So I'm not some sort of, you know, in the desert, shouting at the wind, 
stop blowing. No, this, this, is, this is something that's happening. Um, I want to also take a look at some critical themes and qualities of transformational dialogue. So when you walk out of here today, I'm not going to be teaching you transformational dialogue. I'm going to be teaching you to, th to think about the themes within what I call transformational dialogue. You can then do with that what you want. Right? You know, I'm not trying to... By the way, this, another little thing I just want to say is I'm not trying to pin down some new movement. Like, I don't want to be the next thinker that's created a transformational dialogue that supplants gestalt therapy. And, oh, do you remember when Nick Bolton came along in 2018? <laughs> That Fritz Pearls must have been turning in his grave when Nick Bolton came along and shifted everything he ever thought. No, I don't care about my name. I don't care about transformation, transformational dialogue. I care about the qualities that it might evoke in your practice. That's all. So, last little bit, I want to talk about some tensions and questions that I have myself. Like, as I think this through, sometimes I think to myself, have I gone too far? Like, how is this bordering on X or how is it bordering on Y? I just want to share some of my own personal tensions that I have with this work and what that might mean to you. So, let's talk about a change in coaching context. Now, we'll get you guys involved in a second, not in some weird, let's do some exercises and pretend it matters, but just, I wanna, I wanna have little, I wanna have you thinking about what the, the, the future of coaching is and the context of coaching, but I just wanna share some initial thoughts about the who. When I started as a coach, coaching was predominantly a boardroom executive stroke workplace issue. I happened to work within the public sector. I did a lot of coaching with police officers and social workers. It doesn't really matter. It was paid for by organizations and it tended to have a specific outcome focus that mattered to the organization much more so than the individual. However, over the last few years, the, the, the coaching world has shifted and coaching has come out of the boardroom and it's now become a part of a a world of people facing the reality of life as it is today. So what we saw was the, the sort of political and social crises of 2008, and, 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 and let's, let's name the, the elephant in the political world, Trump and Brexit, and all that kind of stuff made us feel like the world is changing in some way that was a little bit uncomfortable for us. And what that's done is it's, it's made all of us face what it means to be alive in this particular era. It also challenged the idea that coaching was about the ideal, the success story, the next powerful step. You know, when people were losing their job left, right, and center, it's pretty hard to be saying, so tell me about your dream job. So in 2008, things shifted because of the financial collapse, and that's, that was good for coaching, and that it actually made us think about coaching as a human activity, not a success activity. We also see coaching being used increasingly amongst what I would call the relatively affluent parts of society. Let's not pretend that coaching is normalized. Ooh, that was interesting. <laughs> Oh, that's very odd. Law is on the case. Give it up for Law. <laughs> if she succeeds. If she doesn't, boo. How are we doing there, Law? Um, is it, Mr. Mr. Rodney, is, is this working okay still for you? Okay. Um, so we also saw coaching work a bit being used in relatively affluent parts of society. And, and I, I think we shouldn't be under any illusions that coaching is some massively used approach to change in all parts of society. It's still used predominantly in places where there's some level of money. However, we are beginning to see coaching used amongst disadvantaged groups through social impact sch schemes and social sector schemes. So we're beginning to see that shift. And finally, we're also seeing more coaches uniquely developing their own way of practicing and uniquely developing their own um, niches within coaching, which is giving more specialist areas. Can I just check, you guys can hear me relatively okay at the back? Cool, oh, good. So what's the what of coaching? Well, one of the things we've noticed is a shift towards a navigation um, of living in times of change, times of complexity, times of opportunity. Uh, quick show of hands, who's heard the, the VUCA, or sometimes VUCA um, acronym? <laughs> I like that. Never heard of VUCA. VUCA, yes, yes, I know VUCA. <laughs> Ah, oh, it's because Nick's from Cornwall, that's what it is. He can't speak properly. So, so good. Show of hands again, Vuka, Vaka. Cool. I find that so annoying because it's predicated upon the idea that everything's problematic. It's volatile. Oh, dear. It's uncertain. Oh, my goodness me, stress. It's complex. Ooh, how do I get my head around that? It's ambiguous. Oh, how do I decide? Hold on. It's also full of opportunity. It's like, why are you guys here this evening? Because we live in a time when you can actually decide how you want your life to look. So this idea that vaca vuca is, is the predominant theme we're dealing with, I don't buy. I think we're also dealing with people going like, wow, really? I can do this with my life? I just want to get clear on what it is. So that's one thing is I think coaching shifting towards navigation through your life. Um, I think it's also facing all aspects of life. I did this little bullet point purely for Libby. 
I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to use the word shadow, Libby, I'm afraid, but I did put light and dark for you. So I think one of the things we can say is that is coaching is absolutely tackling all aspects of life, light and dark. And in fact, I don't think you can genuinely coach somebody if you're not willing to go where the darkness is, the pain is, the problems are, the, the difficulties are. You know, sometimes I think the first thing we need to do is name what's real that's making life uncomfortable. If we can name what's real, then we have more motivation and desire for change. And if we just go like, oh, imagine a floaty world over there that looks so good. Um, next up, I think coaching is predominantly being used now for personal self-management and emotional intelligence within the workplace. More and more, I think coaching is shifting towards that concept. It's also a space for reflection across life as it unfolds, by which I mean it's no longer only goal-focused. More and more coaching is about a lifelong journey for however long you want to have an effective relationship with your coach for or your client for. Coaching doesn't have to be six sessions. Life unfolds over, less, over more than six sessions, believe me. Actually, who here is older than six sessions old? <laughs> Life unfolds continuously. And the idea that somehow coaching should be about a particular period of time to, to focus on a particular outcome, I think has had its day. Life is unfolding all the time, and a coach can be an effective part of that if, and only if, the relationship still feels and acts as a change agent. The minute it becomes a comfortable zone, you're no, no longer coaching, you're doing something else, which is fine by itself, by the way. You could be, you become a, a friend agent, I don't know, but coaching is coaching and, and, and dialogic. So next up is the how. First of all, there we've seen more and more and more therapeutic influences coming into coaching over the last 15 years. I would say there's not a single school of therapy that doesn't find a place in coaching anymore. It used to be that you had to wait a good 10, 15, 20 years for the therapeutic approaches to enter coaching. Now it's like one pops up over here and it's popping up over here. We're seeing the, the advances in therapeutic approaches showing up in coaching very, very quickly. Similarly, we are seeing more and more management influences. So different management models, different management styles, and different ways of thinking about leadership and management are showing up in coaching and always have done because that was some of coaching's biggest roots. A big one is the integration of practices. You know, more and more we're seeing that coaches aren't just coaches. They are integrating whatever it is they bring to their experience of working with a client, whatever that might be. I'm looking at Kevin here who does all sorts of stuff I can never get my head around. Permaculture, give me three words that describe your way of working, Kevin. Uh, systemic. Um, I kind of got my head around that one nowadays, which is good. Ecosystem. Ecosystem. Design. Design. No idea. And that's fabulous. <laughs> Kevin will be unique as a coach, and I love that. I think coaching needs to be integrative of who you are as a person and all the practices you bring together, not just one way of coaching. And lastly, multiplicity of schools of thoughts, models, frameworks, literally everything is like a hodgepodge. I often describe coaching coaches as being like magpies. We don't really care where the thing comes from. We don't even care if it's true. We just care about is it of service to the client in front of us. So here's where I get you thinking. I've talked about the the where, I've talked about the what, I've talked about the who and the where, whatever, how. Now let's think about the why, let's think about the why. This is what I'm really, really curious about. Some, maybe three years ago, somebody said, Nick, is coaching a fad? Some of you, in a quick show of hands, who's heard me address this question of, of, of why coaching, why now? In a discovery day, introduction of transformational coaching, some context, we've had a chat about why coaching, why now? Not a lot, great. So, I want you to turn to your neighbor and think about this question. Why has coaching taken root now? What is it about the 21st century that means coaching is finding the right soil to grow in? Because believe me, when coaching first was invented in 1940 and it was called personal construct theory, it didn't find a place to land because the society wasn't ready for it. The way we thought about people wasn't ready for it. The way we thought about change wasn't ready for it. The way we thought about the future wasn't ready for it. So what do you think is happening right now, 21st century? That means that coaching has found its feet in a place where it's now the predominant way to think about human change. Have a chat with your neighbor. Three minutes, I'll check in with you. Evelina's entered the room. <laughs> Just felt like saying that to embarrass her, really. Um, so, what are your thoughts? What comes up for you as you think about why coaching is taking root? Yes? Um, we live in a very noisy time. And the one-to-one -one 
whether it's face to face, whether it's Skype, but that's still that's still including noise. Uh -huh. But we live in a very complicated society now, whereas before it was simpler. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. Yes. I think there's the race of a collective consciousness awareness. Okay. Great, thank you. I was back. Um, I think there's been a reduction in stigma and shame of going to any sort of counselling or asking for help from somebody to further yourself. Right, thank you. I think... Libby, did you have one? Oh, I was just putting my hair back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an auction, isn't it? Just bought it, girl. Three <laughs> more. <laughs> Ways of dealing with things, moving mm. away from the harder kind of therapy uh, counselling um, into something a bit more holistic. So right. that, um, yeah. yeah, thank you. I saw quite a few hands. Yes, there. Trisha, is that? Yeah, yeah I was saying that people are more isolated today. You know, stepping behind their phones and computers and social interaction. Yeah. Not having someone. <coughs> and I saw one more just there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the awareness that uh, capitalism is not the key of happiness. Uh -huh. and they need to find in some sense of purpose. Lovely, thank you. So, you know, one of the things I find with, with this conversation is, first of all, it really takes us up to a, a high chunk of what is coaching responded to, which I think is so important. Is that still working? Yep, cool. Um, secondly, uh, it's how we respond to that question is so often a reflection of our own paradigm. So we, you know, the world just is the world. Our response to it is exactly what transformational dialogue is about, which is what is the filter that we've wrapped around ourselves that makes the world look like the way the world looks to us. So if we say, oh, it's information overload, no, it's just information. Whether we receive it as overload as opportunity becomes a reflection of our paradigm. So I always love to hear your views because it's both twofold, giving me some great stuff that you're thinking about, but also, ah, let's think about how you're thinking about it. Let me share the ones that I think is, that is, is important. Um, first of all, the, the fluidity of meaning has become the norm, by which I mean the 20th century was a century in which we started to question the idea of fixed meaning and fixed concepts. So social constructionism, postmodernism, all that sort of stuff made us think philosophically about uncertainty. That has filtered down to what you might think of as popular society or popular way of thinking, and uncertainty is now the norm. We just accept that things have multiple meanings and that things mean things different to me than they mean to you. That's just the way we think now. So when, I've forgotten who said it, was it Gergen? Was it Gergen? Somebody said, um, I think, sorry, I relate, therefore I am. In a sense, we now start to get what that means. Even if we don't know his work or we don't know social constructionism, we understand that meaning is constructed between us, not somehow plucked from a tree of meaning. So I think number one is that meaning is, is, is the, no, the fluidity of meaning is now the norm, not the aberration. Number two, the rise in the personal agency. You know, the 20th century was a time when personal agency wasn't really accepted. We had the psychodynamic school, we had the behavioral school, these schools that said our behaviors were governed by things we weren't in control of. And then the humanistic movement came out of the 1950s and 60s, and coaching is absolutely the zenith, zenith of the thinking about personal agency and freedom of choice. Now, whether that's true almost doesn't matter. Like, there will be people in this room going, hmm, neuroscience is showing us, Nick, that free will is an illusion. Great, I don't care. People feel they've got free will, and they're responding to the feeling of free will, even if they don't have it. Number three is social acceptance of diversity, by which I mean now the idea of, being, of, of choosing jobs that don't fit your social background or whatever it might be. Just, we don't think anything anymore. At least a lot of people just don't think anymore about how somebody shows up in life. So that social diversity has become much more freeing for us as individuals. Affluence is leading to of Maslow's higher needs. Not just self-actualization. Often we think of coaching as self-actualization. No, no, you know, Maslow was talking about stuff like love, belonging as well. You know, they're not necessarily self-actualization. They're just wanting to be a, a, a richly experienced human being. And having a partner or having a context in which you belong is a part of that. So, but it's the higher needs. It's not accommodation. It's not food. It's the stuff that makes us feel more human. Um, then there's the end of knowledge monopoly. So, the, the, you know, when you guys get a little bit of a, 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 a sore tummy or whatever it might be, you don't go to the GP, you check Google, Mr. Google or Miss, Mrs. Google for the answer. So I think, you know, I think the end of knowledge monopoly is a critical thing to how we think about knowledge. Then dialogue as a solution has become the norm. We think of, we think of talking as a way to deal with stuff now. So you know, whether it was with psychotherapy or whether it was with counseling, we now accept that the idea of dialogue is an important part of any given approach to solution. Uh, emotional well-being 
is becoming top of people's priority. And finally, the rise of technology as having personal impact. There are many ways it has personal impact, but just think about how Facebook, for instance, has shifted your perception of yourself or your friends or society or whatever it might be, for good or bad. It's so funny how often I hear people say, oh, Facebook makes us all want to be perfect. Actually, I often find Facebook, people share the vulnerabilities on Facebook. So it's interesting how we see things like Facebook and what that says about our paradigm more than Facebook itself. Either way, we are seeing the, a big impact of personal technology on how we think of ourselves. Now guys, I am conscious that time is flying by. Like I was thinking, how am I gonna fill up an hour? I've got 13 minutes to go and 13 hours of content. So <laughs> what's your preference? Do you wanna stay here till about five in the morning? Um, let me talk about coaching in the future very briefly. First of all, I think there's going to be a greater focus on spiritual intelligence emerging from coaching, as in, as in what is our meaning in life? What is, our, what is our purpose here? It doesn't have to be spiritual in the sense of religion or faith or, or truth or whatever it might be, but somehow beyond, beyond the transaction of, of, of doing life. Next, I think there's a shift to meaning making over goal achievement. This is already happening, by the way, but we're gonna see more and more of this shift towards meaning making rather than goal achievement in coaching. And by the way, I still hear a lot of coaches who would say they were meaning making coaches fall very rapidly into what will you do about this? Which are fundamentally is goal achievement. It's behavioral change coaching, which is fine. I've got no problem with it, but I notice how quickly people fall to it because it feels safer and it feels more rewarding. Next up is from IQ to WeQ. This is a phrase I heard from a guy called Peter Hawkins, one of the founders of, of Supervision. And Peter talks about the idea that society today is about not just how do you do you, but how do you do us? How do you collaborate? How do you work together? And I think coaching is going to become fundamental to the WeQ generation. Oh, that's a nice phrase, WeQ generation. Record it, Rob. You heard it here first. Um, then I think the, the, the increase of artificial intelligence and robotics is going to change things for good. Like so many of you are in jobs that are going to be replaced very soon. Thank goodness you're training as coaches because that won't be replaced by AI. But a lot of jobs are going to go because of artificial intelligence and robots. And that's going to lead to us needing to think about what is uniquely human? What can't a robot do? What can't artificial intelligence do? I'll tell you what they can't do absolutely categorically is no single task. It's being human. Like anything you can put into a task can be and will be done by AI or robots. But being human is the one thing they can't do because intrinsically being human is not AI or robots, right? So literally they can't do that one thing. We can say that categorically. So then the question is, what does it mean to be human? And finally, uh, is, is this one is, is personal development will become the mainstream. And somebody said earlier, I've forgotten who it was, but said there's no stigma attached to the idea of developing yourself or, Absolutely, personal development is going to be mainstream. So this is the context that's changing. So it leaves me with this kind of thought, which is that what's left for human beings is being human. And when that happens, the role of a coach will be to find new routes into meaning making. What is my life worth when I'm not measuring it by the job I do? What is my life worth when it's not about the salary I earn? And by the way, of course, this is happening already. But coaching has to respond to the increasing pressure to find meaning in a world in which work is not going to be your predominant source of meaning making. Or if it is, you have to figure out how you become part of something that's not about delivering tasks because that will be AI robots. Trust me, 20 years, you'll be saying, ah, oh, Nick was right. <laughs> Damn him because I stuck with my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's think about being human together, which is really the, 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 the foundation of, of the transformational dialogue is being human together. Let's talk about that very briefly. First of all, first and foremost, we are humans. We are not a coach. We are not a therapist. We are not a counselor. We are not a mentor. We are not a public speaker. We are not a manager. We are not a leader. We are absolutely categorically, first and foremost, a human being. And so is the person in front of you. And transformational dialogue, to give you the, 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 the punchline of this whole talk, is about responding to what it means for two human beings to be in a space together without being confined to the role they play for each other. So we can then think about the existential relational approach, which gain a little bit technical on you for a second. I would say that's probably the, 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 the fundamental theoretical framework we can draw upon for transformational dialogue is that existential relational approaches recognize that first and foremost there are two organic beings being together. And that what happens to those organic beings is saying something about what's been discussed and explored and surfaced and enacted and so on and so on and so on in that space between these people. And the more we tune into what's happening right here between us, 
the more we tune into the reality, the visceral reality of two human beings being in dialogue. Not what's happening over there, what's happening here. What does this mean to us? And how do we surface the meaning of this as it relates to that stuff? Next up, I think positive regard is, it will continue to be a fundamental plank of how we think about each other. But you'll notice I've dropped off a word. Anyone notice the word? Unconditional, Unconditional positive regard. I'm not convinced. Like, I'm not, by the way, I'm not going to say, it's rubbish, drop it. I just, when I did this slide, I was like, do I really believe that? Do I really believe in unconditional positive regard? I don't know. I'm not even going to try to answer it in front of you. All I know is I felt a liar when I typed it on this slide, so I got rid of it. You can have it if you want. If you want to have unconditional positive regard, you take it. <laughs> I don't want it. But the point is, we do need positive regard. Now, here's the thing. that Most people don't realize what unconditional or conditional positive regard really means. They don't really understand it. Because if they did understand it, they would stop worrying about how they're being with this person. Because to truly regard somebody positively is to trust their resilience. To trust the idea they're not going to collapse under the weight of your wisdom and your advice. You know, when we start to really trust that this person is going to walk out of the coaching session, still themselves, and not go, oh my God, I've got to be so much more like Nick. When we start to realize that they are the best version of themselves inside somewhere and that they can access it, then we have real positive regard rather than like, oh, if I hedge how I ask that question, I won't upset them too much. By the way, if you're worried about upsetting them too much, guess what you're doing? You're judging them. So the idea that we are non-judgmental and then we worry about what question might upset them it's ludicrous, right? Because they're already judging what they're capable of handling. Or if I surface this, this discomfort or this pain, is that going to leave them really upset afterwards? Who cares? It's there already. Let's have a discussion about it. You're thinking, that Nixie's so callous. Yes, I am. <laughs> Next up, let's acknowledge the fragility of human beings. You know, I think if we start to acknowledge the fragility of us as well as them, that my advice is as faulty as their thinking that my feelings are as false as their feelings, that, that I am just as fragile, just as vulnerable to be mistaken as they are, then we can start to actually value what we really have, which is our authentic feeling, not some truth that we have to then shy away from. I can't tell the truth because that's too strong for them. No, it's your truth. When you start to realize your truth is just a fragile representation of your own model of the world, then you start to really be in relationship with somebody. When you think you've got the truth, you haven't got the truth. Does that make sense? Your truth is only a fragile version of your meaning making, which is just as open to being wrong as theirs. I remember somebody saying to me once, Nick, but if you know what they need to do, why won't you tell them? I said, you don't know. Yeah, yeah, but if you know <laughs> what they need to do. Right, but you don't know. No, you know, but there are times when you really know what they need to do. You don't know. Like until you truly embody radical unknowing, you're not really coaching, and you're certainly not in true dialogue. And lastly, a real belief in their capacity of res and resilience. I think that's critical, to really believe in their resilience as a human being, to not try to rescue them, to not try to sort out their problems because it's going to give you self-worth or them self-worth. Trust that they are resilient. By the way, they've lived long before they came to see you because if they're paying you, they're at least over 18 and they've got a job. <laughs> so they've made it to that point somehow. I'm sure you're not going to break them. So let's think about what is transformational dialogue as a response to that. Let's get to the, yeah, let's get to the final five minutes. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to do it in five minutes. Don't worry. Um, let's talk about transformational dialogue. This is my definition. And it's a super duper working definition. Like, I've just created it for you guys tonight. It's not something that I've been thinking about for years. It's just something I've been kind of, I put together. Huh. I've got this now. I've got this. I just turn it off. I turn it back on, and it works. You see how quick I learn. I'm, a, I'm like a learning machine up front here. Um, so here's my definition. Transformational dialogue is an authentic, whole person conversation in which personal and systemic paradigms are explored for possibilities of change and new construal, or, or new construal. That's my current definition as I figured it out yesterday for you guys. Doesn't mean I made it up out of the blue. It's been sort of hovering there, unnamed, unwritten, like, like, like God's law before the Ten Commandments. Just that moment before the Ten Commandments existed, that's what this is. So well, let me explore that a little bit further. First of all, authentic. What do I mean by authentic? I mean truly tapping into 
the space, the you, the them, as it really is in that space. Non-gamed. How many coaches game their coaching? They question themselves, because if I do this, would this happen? They're gaming it. What I mean by, by gaming it, let me, quick, what do I mean by gaming it? Anyone want to throw out what I mean by that? I really mean transactional analysis, which is that the game of TA is that there's a dialogue or there's a transaction that takes place according to a set of rules understood by both parties so that both parties get their winning goal at the end. Remember that from, from your transactions module? Yeah. So, so it's non-gamed. It's authentic. I'm not playing the game of being a coach. I'm not trying to figure out how do I look like a coach in front of this person. I'm being me. And if that doesn't look like a coach, I'm good with that because I'm me. And nobody can deny that part of me that's me because it's me. It's unquestionably me. That's authentic. The minute you can say I'm authentically being me such that nobody can question the meanness of the meanness of the me, you're good. Got it? <laughs> uh, next up is whole person, by which I mean you're looking at the whole system of you. Your thoughts, your feelings, your sensations, everything that makes you who you are at all levels. Now, we used to talk about the head, the heart, the spirit, and the body of coaching. I honestly can't say spirit with an with a, with a honest face because it's not who I am. So I'm going to say the head, the heart, and the body of coaching. You guys can have spirit if you want it. It doesn't work for me, the idea of spirit. I don't believe in transpersonal stuff. It's just not who I am. It doesn't mean you can't. But when I talk about the whole body, sorry, the whole person of coaching, I mean everything that's part of you, your head, your body, your somatic experience, everything, the relational experience, the, everything. It's whole person coaching is to tap into the whole system. Next up is a conversation. It's not a process. Now, you guys are familiar with this because Animas teaches coaching as a conversation, first and foremost. Nonetheless, I would say, in fact, I urge you to check in with yourselves. Do you find yourself following a model at some point? Do you find yourself following a process? By the way, guys, I'm sorry, I'm totally just going to wave at you because you can't see me at all, so hello. Um, do you find yourself... I'm going to just, just to be nice, I'm going to come over here. Without, I'm worried about this going off. Um, do you find yourself following a process in some way? And if you find yourself following a process, are you really in conversation? Or are you in your head doing something? So I think the number, so the conversation is critical. Next up is personal paradigm. Let me talk about personal paradigm. One of my favorite um, articles of all time, I mean, who says that? Favorite article of all time. But anyway, one of my favorite articles of all time, of which there's probably like two, is um, by Colt Rivera, who wrote a, an article called The Psychology of Worldviews. And he talks about every paradigm is fundamentally made up of three belief systems. The existential beliefs, which are how, how, does, how is the world working? What's your ontological belief? What's the, what's, the nature of, what's the nature of microphones that makes them go off and on and off and on? And that's what I can say about, oh, no, I think it's gone for good this time. Hello, hello, hello. hello. Gone for good. So um, existential beliefs are, yeah, it's really gone, isn't it? Okay. Uh, existential beliefs is how, how does the world actually work? What's, what's, what is the, the nature of the world as it is in a very true sense, i.e. gravity exists, God exists, God doesn't exist. These things that we say factually, these are my beliefs about how the world is, how the universe is, what's the nature of the physical world we inhabit, the nature of spirit, all this sort of stuff. Next up is evaluative beliefs, which is, Based on my experience of the world, what have I figured out to be true? This is good, that's bad. Not in terms of values, but let's say eating, <coughs> eating protein is, I like eating a high protein diet is a good thing to do for my health. That's an evaluative belief. Compared to a values belief, which is the prescriptive and the proscriptive, this is where the shoulds live. I should do this, you should do this, I shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. That's the proscriptive and the prescriptive values. Fundamentally, all beliefs can be somehow aligned into either existential, evaluative, and prescriptive and prescriptive beliefs. What that means is where the beliefs lie in that becomes your personal paradigm that shapes your experience of the world as it unfolds in front of you. In other words, depending on, let's let, give you an example to, to make this a little bit less uh, abstract. If you say everything happens for a reason, let me get a little show of hands. Who believes that everything happens for a reason? Oh, come on. I know there's more of you. Coaches always say that. <laughs> Everything happens for a reason. If that's true, then it's an existential belief. And if that's really a belief and something bad happens to you, you should be happy. <laughs> it's happened for a reason. 
but often we're not. We're challenged by the very existential belief that we think we hold. Then the question is, do we really hold it? Or do we hold it because it sounds good or because it, it, it's part of our systemic identity, which I'll go into shortly. Either way, that's an example. Is everything happens for a reason is an existential belief. So next up is systemic paradigms. What I mean by systemic paradigms is we're all part of a nested system that has within it a paradigm of evaluative, existential, and prescriptive and proscriptive beliefs. So here's you. Now, some of you aren't from Animas. Who, who's totally nothing to do with that? You're not a student of Animas. You're irrelevant to, like, you haven't, okay. You, no idea who we are. You're just like, you're here. You thought we were an NHS meeting. <laughs> you went to hear about oncology or something like that. No, you're here with us at Animas. So uh, except for you guys, most of you are part of Animas. I'm gonna use you as an example. Here you are, you're there. You have a set of beliefs, existential, prescriptive, prescriptive, and evaluative. Then you're part of the Animas world, and Animas has a set of beliefs which are existential, blah, 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 blah. You adopt some of those, you become common in terms of how you commonly hold some of those beliefs, and there's an Animas way of thinking about coaching that becomes part of your system. Then there's coaching as a whole. Animas is part of the coaching world. There are things that we believe that also the ICF believe and general coaches believe. Then there is the helping professions. The coaching world is a part of the health professions of psychotherapy and counseling and mentoring and blah, 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 blah. They are in turn part of the working population. They in turn are part of the UK population. They in turn are part of the Western population. They in turn are part of humanity. Those are what's called nested systems. And each of those nested elements will have its own set of paradigms that you will either adopt or in some way respond to. And of course, the further out you get from this centerpiece, the more there'll be difference. And what's really interesting is how strong your beliefs get the further out you go. So if I were to say to you, and this is not to be on record, <laughs> no, just, so if I were to say to you, <laughs> um, I think Trump is an immensely amazing president, like literally probably the best president the US has had in the last, whew, since, Ah, since probably the revolution. Now, I'm guessing from that silence and the lack of rousing applause <laughs> that you disagree with me. What's interesting is if we had that conversation over a cup of coffee, you would be vehemently opposing me. What's interesting is the, the further out we get from our actual core experience of being alive, the stronger our beliefs get. It's really surreal. We can argue to death about beliefs that lie out here, even though they're the least likely to be held in common. Right? Does that make sense? They're the least likely to be held in common, and yet we expect people to hold them in common. Let us sink in for a second. We argue most about where we have the least probability of actually agreeing. <laughs> Isn't that odd? Now, of course, what's happening there is your internal paradigm, your, your systemic paradigm and your personal paradigm are being challenged at the ultimate level of existential, evaluative, prescriptive, prescriptive beliefs. And that's what you're responding to. So what's this all got to do with authentic, uh, sorry, with transformational dialogue? Well, finally, we're looking to open up that paradigm to possible change or new construal. I use that word construal very, very advisedly or very, very deliberately, let's say, because it came from the work of George Kelly, who wrote Personal Construct Theory. Anyone familiar with PCT, Personal Construct Theory? Do, do read it, it's wonderful. He talks about the idea that the role of the, of the personal construct therapist is to help somebody reconstrue their life or reconstrue a situation. I think that's what we're all about as coaches, is reconstruing. In other words, rethinking through and re-understanding and reconfiguring a situation such that it changes in front of us. And that could be through behaviors, it could be through thinking, it could be through feeling, it could be through mindful self-management, all that kind of stuff. Either way, there's a new construction that comes out. So I'm gonna stop for a second and just see if there are any questions arising at the moment before I move into influences, precursors, and then the qualities and, and um, <clears throat> critical issues within TD, as I call it. TD, I like that. So, questions at the moment? Yes, Lorraine. It's more of an observation. I mean, it sounds really simple. Oh, all we have to do is be ourselves uh -huh. and see the person as themselves. Yeah. But it's not that simple at all. Of course not. Let's get to the complexity of it. Next slide, please. <laughs> so let's think about the influences and precursors to this, because I, as I said at the start, I'm, we're, we're absolutely not alone in thinking about transformational dialogue. And the classic one is existential theory. I'm not gonna go into these, we just simply don't have time, but I just wanna put them on your radar to explore, should you want to. Existential theory would say, ha, Nick Bolton. 
I've been talking about this for the last 200 years. So existential, ooh, that's interesting. Um, random bullet points is another <laughs> influence and precursor. So personal construct theory is huge as a precursor to this. It's my precursor. I would say when I first read George Kelly, I was like, wow, not only do I think this is already coaching or was coaching, but it shifted my perception of how, coach, how far coaching could go. Next up, gestalt practices. You know, so much of gestalt is about the, the field of influence between organic beings. It's a very organic related practice. Say hello again, just to be organic with you guys. Um, you know, gestalt is about organic presence and organic beings being affected by each other. Narrative collaborative practices are huge, hugely impactful. So the work of Reinhard Stelter, the work of Michael White with narrative therapy, all the stuff that Rob has talked about as well, that stuff is huge in how we start to think about coaching moving forward. And then worldview psychology. So check out Colt Rivera. Specifically, David Bohm on Dialogue is a wonderful book to think, to think about as a precursor to what I'm about to say. Colt Rivera, Psychology Worldviews. Reinhard Stelter, Third Generation Coaching was a wonderful book that came out 2003, quite early, I think, 2000, maybe. Um, and then Hetty Isaac's new book, uh, The Future of Coaching, which introduces new generation coaching. So what I'm saying is not entirely new, but I, I hope I'll give it a bit of a fresh slant now. And don't forget, we will get the, the bullet points to you. So, qualities of transformational dialogue. So number one, authentic and non-gamed. I won't go further into this. I've, I've mentioned this quite a lot already. But it's really about being honest with yourself about what's going on for you. What is, what's, the, what's the driver in your head? And where's that coming from? You know, what is the compulsion? Or what's the question? Or what's the strategic choice you're making, et cetera, et cetera. Be honest with what's driving you. Is it, is it a need to, be, to satisfy something inside yourself? Is it a compulsion? Or is it genuinely dialogic? Is it genuinely relational? So be authentic and non-gamed. Collaborative. It's a very collaborative practice, by which I mean that everything is up for grabs by both parties. We are not trying to manage. One of the things I see so much of is the coach managing the process, the coach managing the behaviors, the coach managing the client. Instead of collaborating with that client, instead of saying, where are we? Are we on the same page? What's our next step? Does this feel, does this feel like it's working? Where, where are we together? What's the next move? So I hear people say things like, um, I've come to the end of my sessions. I'm not sure whether I should renew my contract with this client or would it make them uh, reliant on me? It's not yours to decide. That's a relationship question. So collaboration takes the weight off your shoulders. I mean, one thing I'd say is that when you become truly collaborative, there's no responsibility left other than the responsibility of being authentic because then everything's a collaborative choice. They make the choice as much as you do. Uh, yeah, that's enough said on that. Next up is surfacing the paradigm drivers, by which I mean the cult co existential, evaluative, prescriptive and prescriptive beliefs. The key to why it's transformational is that it's deliberately and purposefully surfacing the paradigm beliefs that are impacting the thing that's being brought to you. Make sense? So somebody's bringing something to you, they want a pay rise. I mean, nobody's gonna bring that to you, but let's, they want, a, they, want a, they want a next career, great. What's the paradigm that's making them come to you? What's the paradigm that makes that problematic? that it's not just happening? What is the, what's the thing that makes a relationship with you an important constituent part of the success of getting a new career? Because why not just go and do it? Why not just go and get a new career? There's something that's happening that makes you a, a part of that journey. What is the paradigm that makes that important? It's gotta be provocative and, and uncomfortable, I believe. By the way, you might disagree and that's fine, but I believe that transformational dialogue at its heart is uncomfortable. It's, 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 it's challenging, it's provocative, it's making you go places you don't, you don't want to go. You know, some, some of you know the story of I was coaching somebody and I said, if I were to take a contract out on your life, such that in a, in a month's time, you haven't made progress on this issue, what would you do? And she said, I would do my nails. And I said, whoa. I didn't say like, quite like that, but I was like, whoa. I said, the, that contract killer is still coming for you. What do you mean, do your nails? And she said, Nick, I've realized I've got to look after myself. Now for me, that was such a momentous shift in the coaching because this coaching had started about building a business and all the way through, we could see there was something underneath that was problematic to that, but she wasn't facing the truth of it. And when I put a contract killer in the picture, it suddenly changed things because you can't say, I'm gonna do my nails and still say it matters to you when you're about to be shot dead in a month, right? Would you agree with that? I'll do my nails first and then I'll do my marketing. So there's something, <laughs> You know, when you're provocative, you can really bring the extreme of somebody's feelings. 
And going along with, along, along with that is being playful and irreverent. I think coaching is so serious sometimes. We sit there with our crossed legs and, you know, we have our arms crossed because we're listening intently. And, and if we feel, I'm guessing you're laughing because you're going like, yep, that's me. <laughs> and we have a piece of paper because we need to take all the notes down about their life so we can come back to it later on and replay it to them. Be playful, be irreverent. <laughs> I love your face. Like, no, I don't do that. Good. <laughs> so be playful, be irreverent. You're creating a space of playful dialogue such you can start to challenge the client to really think outside their normal patterns of behavior. At the same time, it's compassionately courageous. You're being courageous on behalf of the client. You're, you are putting yourself at risk of being judged. You're putting yourself at risk of getting it wrong. You're putting yourself at risk of upsetting somebody or breaking the rules on behalf of the client because you care about them. That's compassionate courage. Now, it's really funny. This, I forgot who said this at the start. Was it Charlie? Was it you who said this about drawing out the patterns? Yeah. It's absolutely what I would encourage you to do towards transformational dialogue, which is move towards patterns. The more you move away from detail to patterns, the more you start to surface the paradigm because the pattern reveals a bigger act at play than just the detail. So start to draw out the patterns. Now here's a really, one I found very, very important for me over the years is everything has value. Every single thing has value. And you are first and foremost a coach, not a business person. One of the things I see a lot is when somebody has a business issue within coaching, the first thing they do is they go to the business component of that. So they say, oh, my client hasn't done this. What should I do because it's in the contract? Well, how about think about it this way? Your client hasn't done something that's contractual. What does that say about their paradigm? What if you were to use the fact they've broken your contract, not paid you, not turned up on time, not whatever, as material, as grist for the mill of the coaching work you're doing? Now, if they're not showing up, and of course you have to figure out how you get the money off them or how you end the contract or whatever you decide to do, but we too quickly go to the working part of the, of the coaching relationship rather than recognizing that everything has value. Many of you will know the story that when I was coaching a lady some years ago, and it's still on the Animus Connect site where you can listen to it, I was coaching a lady called Gail, and as I coached her, she was constantly typing. Type, 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 because we were, we were coaching by Skype. And one of my students was listening to the session and said, Nick, if I were coaching her, I would ask her to close her computer and be fully present. Well, number one, if she closed the computer, Skype would go off. <laughs> but more importantly, what would I miss about how she sees life if I were to stop her typing? What does that typing mean to her? What was she trying to achieve by typing nonstop? As it was, we surfaced the fact that in a way, and by the way, the, 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 the journey she was on with me was about being more present in life. <laughs> Aha, right. So if I had managed her presence, what would she have learned about herself? Nothing other than Nick manages my presence. But instead, I'm able to go like, what does this constant typing say about your desire or your journey towards greater presence? And what is that constant typing about? As it was, it was about trying to capture all the information she could glean from our conversations such that she could then think about it again and then think about how she might do some actions based on it. The more we started to surface the, the meaning of that typing, the more she's able to see her paradigm that was at play. Make sense? Her paradigm being one of trying to find certainty in an essentially uncertain world, and how that certainty was stopping her being present in what is mainly a state of uncertainty. So when she, she was faced, she had an autistic son who when he was in the shower, would often go sort of not, she, she would, I, think, I think she used the word kicked off. She didn't know when that was gonna happen, so she was facing uncertainty. Is he gonna kick off, is he not? And if he does, how do I manage it? So she was trying to find certainty in an essentially uncertain context, and that was stopping her going into presence. So those are some of the, 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 the kind of the qualities that I would expect to see. Now I wanna dive a little bit further into, um, into some of the critical themes that I think will emerge for this from you if you start to play with this in your own practice. Number one is, is Discussing what is versus what might be. I think too often coaches err on the side of what might be. As in, what is it you want to achieve? What's over there? Rather than what's real for you right now. What's absolutely present? That same client who, who um, had, was being coached on, on growing her business, 
the fundamental question at heart was her, her authentic and honest relationship with her husband. Nothing to do with business. Now, had we not named the reality of that, we would have worked on some spurious goal of creating a business that was really just a plaster over the crack of the lack of honesty in a relationship. By naming what really is happening rather than what you want to be, you get to the truth of the current situation. Somebody else talked about that earlier, about naming the elephant in the room. Who was that? Was that you as well, Charlie? No. Somebody mentioned elephant in the room. Who was that? She's, she's in denial. <laughs> she doesn't want to admit it. Um, next up is, is working with the here and now or the, then, the there and then. And I think increasingly when we start to work with transformational dialogue, we're working, we're working on the here and now. What's happening here? What does how you're showing up here say about what's over there? Too often, what's happening here is nothing more than a dialogue about what's happening there. I think we need to tune in more to this. The typing is a here and now experience, which we can then think about how does that typing relate to that, which is the there and then. Then there's inquiry versus resolution. Again, I think coaching focuses heavily on resolution, i.e., what's the change you want to make and how do we help you make it? Increasingly, as we move into this new era we've talked about, meaning making, uh, coaching as, a, as an unfolding journey, we're gonna explore a state of inquiry rather than resolution. Resolution will come. Trust, like if you truly trust Cole Rogers' words, about self-actualization, then inquiry will be an intrinsic and almost inevitable part of the resolution. But if we think we have to get to resolution, then deep down there's a grain of doubt for you about, about, about self-actualization. Deep down. I remember once I said, we were talking about self-actualization, and I said, that, you know, classically we talk about self-actualization being an acorn will grow into an oak tree. Or, or every time. What does it need? So is, and I, would, I would say to people, what does it need? And they say, light, oxygen, water, soil, space, absolutely the right conditions. And then somebody said, which made me laugh so much, well, I laughed inside so much, I was very polite on the outside, but they said, somebody to water it. And I was like, I'm sure acorns existed before gardeners. <laughs> I'm sure oak trees managed somehow before gardeners came along. So it's interesting how often we think that it needs somebody to water it. Well, actually, inquiry is about enabling the person to water themselves in the long run, rather than thinking only about resolution. I think understanding versus planning, which is, goes akin to inquiry versus resolution, which is I think the ultimate aim of transformational dialogue is to help somebody truly understand their paradigm at a deeper level, such that the ripples of change that come from it will be much broader than simply planning a particular change event whether that's start a business or whether that's get a relationship or whether that's get a career, that's a change event that requires planning. Inquiry and understanding is about understanding the paradigm that's pushing you through life in some way or another. Emergence versus determination is another, what you might call a tension or a paradox within this, which is I think as transformational dialogue, dialogicians, <laughs> horrible, horrible name, apologies for that, but as transformational dialogicians, we're focused both on emergence and determination, by which I mean determination is what do I want to achieve, emergence is what's coming out. What's emerging from the conversation that I had no idea might come from this conversation? That's emergence. Determination or determinism is this is what I want to achieve, here's how I'm going to achieve it. Both have a role to play, but I think transformational dialogue will, <laughs> will err on the side of emergence over, over determinism. So next up, curiosity versus presence. This is something I've been playing with a little bit recently. And I talked to, the, to a group recently about this. Um, Marcus and Emily, you were there. I'm not sure you totally bought my argument, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> which was that I think curiosity is something that as, as coaches we're often encouraged to have. Yes, I agree with that. But I think the problem with curiosity is it's being driven by what we're interested in. We too often are curious and then drive the conversation down, what are we curious about? Rather than thinking about what's the client curious about? Presence is creating the space for a client to reveal where their trajectory takes them. Curiosity is about where do we want them to go based on what's interesting us. Because every time you ask a question, you direct that conversation. Every time you ask a question, you are, you are pushing the change process, pushing the transformation, pushing, pushing the dialogue in a way that interests you. When we're present, 
we're allowing more time for the client to reveal what's interesting them. And I think we need to do more of that. Allow them to talk more, because in that talking will come the stuff that's really driving them. Now here's another one which I've been playing with recently, which is questioning with instead of questioning of. I think, again, as coaches, we're often questioning of. What do, I, what do you think I mean? I'm going to throw this to you. What do you think I mean by questioning of? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Anything else? So here's what I mean by it, is that when we're questioning of, it's the classic coaching approach that you have the answer. My job's to question you, and I'm going to draw out of this person the answer they have inside themselves. Classic coaching, perfectly valid, perfectly good way to work. When I'm questioning with, I'm questioning alongside and looking at the thing together and saying, what is, what is this thing that we're struggling with? I'm not saying, hey, client, tell me the answer. Hey, you've got the answer. Some, you know, like the classic, if you did have the answer, what would it be? Like that classic annoying coaching question that coaches ask. <laughs> it's, because, it's because we're always pushing the responsibility to the client. We're not in dialogue with them. We are in interrogation with them. Hey, Matteo, you have the answer. My job is to get it out of you. What if that wasn't the case? What if the answer exists somewhere here? And that together we are in dialogue to explore what that might be. That's questioning with the client versus questioning of the client. I think when we think about transformational dialogue, we're talking questioning with the client. Then there's the self and the other. And uh, what I mean by that is, where's our focus of attention? I think often our focus of attention is almost too much on the client. It sounds weird to say, doesn't it, as a coach? I think it's too much on the client. We're listening for everything the client's doing, saying blah, 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 not noticing what's going on for us. I think the, the continuum that we need to work across is an awareness of ourselves as a being and that person as a being. This is the thing about two human beings being in dialogue, is that there's stuff happening for me. I need to be aware of that. Cause versus effect. As a transformational dialogue practitioner, <laughs> Um, I'm interested in what's causing stuff. Usually in coaching we say like, oh, I don't care about the why. I don't care about the why, I just care about the how you're going to change. Okay? But what if that why holds the answer to many other things? What if that why has many ripples in it? And by only focusing on the individual change process, we miss the bigger paradigm that's causing this in the first place. So I'm curious about the why. That doesn't mean I'm necessarily going back to a therapeutic approach to the, the root cause in history or in the childhood, but I'm interested in the paradigm why. What is the paradigm that's at play here? And then finally, past, present, and future. Again, I want to be a little bit challenging to coaches because I think coaches too often focus on the future, the what might be. The <laughs> I've got to stop looking at you because you keep shaking your head like, well, oh, I don't do that. <laughs> Nick, I'm with you all the way. <laughs> um, I think too often we look at the future and we forget, A, the present, as in what's happening right here and what's happening out there, but also we forget what's back there. I think the past has relevance. For any of you who have have watched my talk called The Temporal Self, you'll know that I'm, I'm interested in what somebody's relationship is with time mm -hmm. and how do they position themselves against time, past, present, and future. What's the big driver in their life and what's causing that as to be a driver? <clears throat> All right, guys, I'm on to the, the final slide now because I am conscious of time. Um, and I'm going to do some reflections with you, get some questions. I just want to talk through some tensions and questions that I personally have, ones that worry me sometimes about where I'm heading. So number one is, does transformational dialogue stray too far from coaching roots? I don't know. By the way, I'm not intending to answer this right now with you. These are questions that I'm being authentic about and sharing with you. I worry sometimes. I even said it to Marcus and Emily at a training session a few weeks ago. I said, sometimes I forget that Really basic coaching can be very powerful. <laughs> like helping somebody set a SMART goal can be transformational in its own right. Now, often when you've been doing it for a long time, you kind of edge away from those practices because A, you sort of grow through them and B, they get a little bit boring after a while. Let's be honest. So is this just me finding a new way to practice that's actually not that good? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm being very honest in sharing with you that I don't know, but I'm, I love the way I practice. I think my clients love the way I practice. 
Has it strayed too far from coaching? Maybe. That's why I said at the very start, you might say, this is rubbish. This isn't relevant. It's not true. It's not well thought through. You might be right. And you are right for you. Yeah. Next up is, what is the relationship between transformational dialogue and psychotherapy? I don't have an answer for that yet. What I do feel is that, and I've often used this, this example, if we think about somebody on the edge of suicide, we know they need to be seeing a therapist or counselor or something like that, or probably in, in clinical, you know, clinical um, care. If we think about somebody who wants to grow their business by a thousand percent, we know coaching's the right place, not a therapist. But it's when we move in the middle section, we get to this gray zone, that it feels a little bit like almost like two magnets coming together and there's sort of a sense of energy that pushes them. I don't know what the answer is. What I do know is that many of the clients I see could definitely see a psychotherapist and get great value, and they could definitely see me and great value. I'm not too worried about that, but I am conscious that as a school, we need to be careful about saying the boundaries don't matter. I would say that psychotherapy is only 150 years old, less, probably much less. If you think about say, I mean, obviously it existed before Freud, but Freud and his, his most significant, significant work, 1900 onwards. And yet we put so much, um, we put so much weight on it as an authority. But what if, what if it doesn't have that weight of authority? What if coaching really and dialogue really is the next evolution of that? I don't know. The only reason we so often go back to psychotherapy and counseling is because A, we like to honor the past and B, we're scared of being sued. Um, next up is when do you focus on behaviors and when do you focus on paradigms? Like I know as an individual that I often change best by, by being in motion and in practice. So many years ago, somebody said to me, Nick, how did you overcome your limiting beliefs in order to start your business? I said, I didn't. I just ignored them. And that was absolutely true. Because the point is that when you create something in the world that means that the beliefs you held can't be held anymore, that's the best way to lose those beliefs. So, and that often comes from behaviors, not from paradigm exploration. So I have a bit of a tension between, am I straying so far from behavioral change that we just end up looking at our navels forever? I don't know. The best way to kind of figure that out is to be in a collaborative space that says, is there change happening? Where are you noticing change happening? If it's not, get off your ass and do something. Like I think in the end, that's gotta be, you know, the, the collaborative answer is, is there something shifting for you? Um, I think that's the last one, yeah. So the last one is, what are the ethics at the boundary edges? You know, when, when, does it, when does it feel like we're stepping outside our competence zone? We're in dialogue, it's all good, Kevin. We're in dialogue. But then the person goes and divorces their wife, leaves their kids, does all this stuff, and then regrets it 10 years later. Like, what is the, what is our, what's our responsibility with this work? These are, these are, I don't have answers, I have questions about this because I recognize that the more I play in transformational dialogue, the more I dive into the deepest parts of somebody's life. And that's, that, that carries responsibility. Like my shoulders need to be as broad as my arms are wide like this. Because in a way, that's, you're part of that change for that person. So guys, that's what I've got to say this evening about transformational, transformational dialogue.